their about the about page, so <laughs> Welcome to the Flory Models. I almost said PM then. Jesus, what day are we on? It's because you're all wearing <laughs> uniform at the top half. Look, we've got the dark side, <laughs> the light side. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the Flory Models live show. Here we are with you Thursday night on the 22nd of July. Hopefully the last day of the heat wave. Yay! Cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That was summer. Do you enjoy it? Yeah, yeah fantastic. Highlights of your summer wear. <laughs> bloody hot and sweaty and yeah don't like it so uh, yeah. anyway we trust you're all doing very well at home let me just turn me chatty thing on there we go very good night do you, do you like the new tan yeah no didn't take much work <laughs> literally yeah. 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 do you know what? i was doing some editing earlier and i'm sat here and i'm working on uh, the vulcan and then i'm like white as a ghost and then in the next shot i'm like glowing it's like oh, look. <laughs> looks like i've had a spray tan <laughs> <laughs> so yeah there's a bit of continuity error between those two shots uh but anyway yes we're all doing very well here trust you're all doing very well at home as well how's it going so how are we doing then right who wants to start i'll tell you what we'll go clockwise around the clock so matt how's things very well very, yes very well cool i'm all right i'm cool i'm cool in here today it's lovely lovely in the uh, chilled chilled out room of the yes. pm towers yes <laughs> nice yeah, thanks, Rob. That's put me right oh. off me uh, pasta dish. <laughs> Rob says heat wave. He's sat here naked. Nice. Oh. Uh, that's yeah. a sight we don't need to see. Anyway, <laughs> Andy, how are you? Yeah, fine, thanks. Um, got the window open and the blinds look like they're trying to attack me, but yes, coming through the window. But yes, yeah, all right, not too bad at all. Hey, show me your new aircon unit. <laughs> yeah, turn your new aircon unit on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <you're> right. <laughs> all the, all the yeah. dust that comes out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and John, he's got his door open in there, looking very cool today. Yeah, doors open, fans on. It's been hot this week. It has. Poor John, for people who don't know, he's our resident uh, postman, and he's it's, been. Yeah, it's been a nightmare. I think you lot ought to like, you know, ask for air conditioning in your vans. Yeah, right. Like that'll never happen. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, I was talking to someone this week and he works for Wessex Water hmm. and apparently Wessex Water are paying to have the air con removed from the vans because hmm. the guys aren't getting any work done. They're just sat in the vans not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> and there's me with the windows wound down, the heater on code blasting out full blast. Yes, blowing out warm air. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> nice. You want to stay cool. No, not good. It's, hey, it's all right saying Arizona is 44, but that's a desert. Yeah. Yeah. There's no humidity in there. We, we live on an island in the Atlantic. Yeah. And we don't like it. hot weather. Yes. There's lots of water surrounding it that sucks all the... Uh, yeah. Makes the heat go very, very wet. Yeah. All the goodness out there. <laughs> that's why we're in a green and present land. <laughs> yeah. And Nathan, how are you doing? I'm all right. It's it, I'm gonna be the same as everybody else and moan about how it's getting warmer in here with these lights on. Yes. <laughs> Watch me slowly melt this evening. It is. It's that thing, isn't it? Because obviously I've done some filming down here today. I've been doing a little bit more work on the Vulcan, a little bit more work on the truck. And uh, after an hour in here, I've literally I have my rag. Friend of mine, I can't carry this thing everywhere. I'm like dripping off bottles of water and all the rest of it. It's just not pleasant at all. But now I say I've got the windows all open, but you can't do that when you're doing normal filming because of the car noises and stuff like that or blinds rattling. So if you do hear some knocking on the show, it's how everyone's blind. I know Andy's getting attacked by his occasionally. Mine are banging on the back of one of my cabinets that I've got down here. So uh, if you do hear anything like it, it's just you know the air trying to get in and out. So. Um, Yes. I, what I want to know is, is it a very um, UK thing to moan about the weather or is it a global thing? Because we do like to whine about the weather. Oh, God, I yeah, don't we? <laughs> oh, yeah. And then you yeah. see it in other places, don't you? Like China, there they are, stood in a subway in, a, you know, in an underground up to this yeah, in water. 
you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, and but there's us like worried about the uh, the odd little deluge and like you know, other places are up in smoke and on fire, and we worry it's a bit warm, you know. So uh, it's turned, just gone over twenty five degrees. That's it. Stop. Yeah. Everything stops. Or a bit of snow. Absolutely. Of snow. And that's it because we just can't cope with anything. We are literally an island nation. We're used to temperate climate. In the summer, it's like twenty twenty five degrees, and in the winter, it's just about freezing ish, and that's about it. But we don't properly have snow and we don't properly have hot weather you know no. we don't really get flooded that often although it's getting a bit more often these days uh so yeah so when it does happen we like to make a thing out of it definitely <laughs> so anyway like about it. yes anyway uh slightly different format tonight uh we're trying to do a few new things thanks for all your feedback obviously it has all been taken on board so things are changing a little bit uh over the next few weeks uh so what we're going to do today from now on on the thursday night show we've got theme night okay so the way this is going to work is is that we will come up with different themes you know if you've got any suggestions let us know and we will definitely take them under consideration they might end up propping up something but you never know uh but uh, the idea is we'll come up with a theme like a manufacturer something else like that we can talk about or a product an item something's happening in the news all the usual bits and pieces like that and we'll discuss like that we'll still do the q and a's as well on a thursday night so don't fear not all your questions that have been locked in uh we'll be answering a little bit later but what we will do is that if anybody's got sort of shout outs as we call them and things like that they're going to get deferred over to another upcoming show that we'll be doing okay so obviously the you know that's how that works so this is purely for talking about various things talking about obviously us because we're great uh and then obviously we'll be doing you know answering your questions that are proper questions okay so that's how it's going to work Basically, Friday is going to be a highlights reel day, and then I will look at the guys will pick out various models that has taken their eye like we normally do at the first part of this show. I will do on tomorrow's show because I'm going to do it as a standalone with me. It'll be a recorded show, edited, and all the bits and pieces like that, and it'll be a rundown of what's gone on. And it'll be, you know, anything sort of 20 minutes, half hour long, and that's it. And like we spoke about the other day, is that once or twice a month we're going to be doing Saturday build along mornings. So the Saturday live show is coming back. Uh, and the guys will be on if they're available uh, if not it's sort of be me and Matt uh, as well and we will be building and that's where we'll be doing your shout out one so if you've got any shout outs anything you want to talk about generally as we can build you know that's the whole point so we're going to be showing you various bits and pieces on like that from my point of view Mondays basically remain the same video builds all the rest of it you still get full video builds and everything obviously on a friday reviews as and when i can slip them through we've got a review coming up for you tomorrow uh and then obviously we've got the other things going amongst it on the tuesdays we'll go back to doing the tutorial videos the little short bite-sized ones tall tuesday makes a return from there answering a few questions things like that as well so literally that's going to happen yeah, how it's going to work from now on and we'll tweak it as we make our way along and everything else but thanks for your all your input and various things as well so um good job on that so well done why is andy looking so confused john christmas asked me if, I, if i've received his email and he asked no him. no <laughs> <laughs> yes it, it, yeah is it one of those no we haven't i had one like that earlier somebody said did you get my message and i'm like no and i'm looking for everywhere and i couldn't find it either yeah, the only last email i had from me john was a uh, third of june hmm. about a brush okay send it again. that's the one send it again. did you answer it send, send again or pm me off the forum yes yeah, PM me off the forum. that'll be better very good so anyway uh Today we are talking about Zvezda. I know this is a company we haven't really covered in depth and perhaps a lot of you aren't really aware of Zvezda uh, and what they're doing and obviously they are one of those companies that sort of come along definitely in the last sort of you know 10 years have gone from being you know mediocre kit they've done some sort of stuff and some things but it was never anything you would literally shout out about let's face it to being really really good and they're a company as well that with each build that i think they're learning from uh you know the design the way it's going on now and they're producing now pretty much all of their kits are absolutely fantastic coming down the line and i've had moans about them before because i've obviously spoken about the, the blandness shall we say uh on the hind uh the 48 scale hind uh wasn't much up to it it's very similar to the 70 second 70 second i think you can get away with it but definitely when you're talking about the sort of 48 scale you're expecting a few more niceties and things like that but the team around us have built the odd bit of zvezda over the yeah. last uh thingies haven't we so um, mm, yeah. 
who wants to start? Andy, do you want to show yours first? Yeah, my sponsored tonight <laughs> by <laughs> Portuguese Superbock. Yes, I, I built this one a while ago. I can't remember what single group build it's for, to be honest with you. But it was it's huge it thing. Is. Um, it's fair in my defense, it could do a bit more weathering, but it's all it's really had is a um foil wash on it. But it went together really, really nice. It was a nice build, uh, went together well, easy. The only problem, the only problem I do have is the undercarriage is very fragile, yes. To do with um, yeah, it's a big lump to sit on, just like little undercarriage. But just point out with... to people that's actually 70 second scale, isn't it? Yeah, same seconds ago, yeah. Because a lot of people might think that's 48th and it's not. That shows how big that helicopter is. I mean, that's 70 seconds ago. Oh, don't break it. Don't break and it. And that is a 70 second scale tank. Yes. It is big absolutely though. huge. It's massive, yeah. <laughs> That'd go in the back of it like that. Yeah, it's, it's a big a big lump. Um, yeah, it went together really well. I was pleased with it, to be honest with you. I think the thing is with Sylvester, is that I think in the chat people are um, on about their early stuff is not good. Mm. Yeah. You need to go for the last five, six years, would we say? Mm -hmm. Perhaps seven? Yes, yeah. You, it's, a, it's like ICM. Yeah. ICM started off not great and mm -hmm. not really good, and Zavesta have done the same. They've obviously brought in a different team of people for designing, and they've, let's be honest, they've, they've tried to copy the Tammy mould. I think that's where it's all come from, hasn't it, to be yeah. honest. and. Yeah. They're getting there. They're definitely getting there, but the early stuff is because I think uh, so it was on about the BT7 in chat, mm -hmm. which is not great. I don't, you know, I know Italia's reboxed it as well at some point. That's it's not a good kit. But you go for the later stuff. Again, I check dates, and then they're really starting to come good. I mean, I have got here as well one of Andy's, which is his T90. To be fair, nice. I bought that one because of the price. Because I've also got the uh, Meng one that I bought at the same sort of time. And that means two thousand. I'm just looking on schedule. It's 2011. That one's from. Hmm. So it's ten, 10 years old. Um, it was the first Vesta I've ever ever built. And again, went together really, really well. It was a fairly simple build. It's nice and detailed. It is. Like it's cool. Yeah. It's got Lincoln length tracks, so it makes it easy to go together. Yeah, where you just like got the full length top and bottoms, and then so like you have to do the round the. Um, sprockets and things but well, yeah. if i remember rightly this is probably like their t90 was the first of when they were became good kits yeah i think so yeah it's around yeah. that time yeah and they did that thingy gun as well the um the self-propelled gun on the i can't think what it's called the mistel miss still is it or something mm -hmm. yeah they're doing seven second hour as well they've downscaled it that was about yeah. the same time I, I, we've got it in the shop somewhere but anyway and then after that, I think like their armor kits have come on leaps and bounds, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely um, an easier build than the main I one. And even turntable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's easier, yeah. easier build than the main <laughs> one. And I'd say it was probably, it's probably, yeah, you wouldn't know if you, if you, if you, if you put, put them both side by side, I think you'd be pushed to tell which was which, I think. Probably. Yeah, I agree. I think the details there and all the, um, spin it around again. You know, for the tanks at the back, yeah. and stuff. Do you know what baffled me? Why they've never done a T55? Good point, yeah. Yeah. Because that is the most iconic one of, apart from a T34, which they do, it's probably the most Russian-Soviet iconic tank after a T34 to me. They seem so to sort of go more modern stuff though, don't they? Like yeah, the... T90s and stuff, yeah. T80s yeah. the T80 as well, aren't they? T80 mm. and they've done the um, shulker and things like that, haven't they? And yeah, yeah, and the, and the stuff they're bringing out now. But yeah, they've never done a T55, which always makes me wonder why, or a T even a T62, I suppose, but more a T55. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Fine. You know, being a, a Russian company, shall we say, you thought that'd have been a staple, but yes. you never know. They might do. Hmm. They might do. Definitely. Yeah. Good so job, our other uh, resident uh, Zesda fan, clearly, as you can see by the collection he has around him and has built, is John. So what's your uh, theory on them? Yeah, for me, Zesda probably took off for me when they released their 72nd scale Harley. 
Yeah. Because that, yeah. Yeah, that I think that was their breakthrough kit. Um, I've just done a little bit of research on them. Actually, actually they were founded in 1990 by a group of modeling enthusiasts. So, there's hope for us yet. Yeah, it's exactly. yeah. We can found us, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they've, they've started off as a group of modelers, and yeah, their early stuff is a bit ropey. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I'd say from the hind onwards, they produce some fantastic kits. I've got their little berry up here, which I built at the start of the year. year. And that you could build that in a weekend. Mm. That's a really nice little mojo builder. Um, Matt's got the MiG 29 of theirs that I built up at the. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I was get it. Go get, get it, Matt. Yeah, I, thought, I forgot about that. That's another cracking kit. I haven't got the hind anymore. Yeah. Um, nor have I got their T 34 anymore. I built that. That's a cracking kit. Mm hmm. Um, for someone that's not an armor enthusiast, that yeah, not over complicated, goes together really well, produces a nice model. Hmm. And as you can see, I've got I've, I've got a few of their kits in the stash to build. Yes, one or two. <laughs> James says, shouldn't John be speaking Russian? He is he just through a translator. That yeah, that's good. Yeah. Translate. <laughs> but yeah, now. Apparently now they've got over 210 employees. Oh, there we go. So there's uh, John's MIG, looking very nice, splendid. Yeah, that's another cracking little kit, that one. Hmm. The uh, SMT. There you go. Just as a comparison, if it were on camera, there's my SU-27 we built, which is the best as I forgot I'd built that. All right, bring them down a little bit. Push your mat to the Hold on. right. I'll bring the camera up. Oh, all right. That's it. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Which again, I think that's the first of best to get our built. And yeah. We built them all together, did we? Because some of you built Trumpies and some of you built um, yeah. Sylvester's. Yeah. Yeah. Great kit. Really well detailed. Get the mining got it, but get ladder and pilot and and it's really well detailed. Full um, mining weapon up, but you get the weapons and stuff as well. Yeah. I think that's what, 20 summit quid the retail at. Yeah, that was the nice thing. The price is nothing, is it? They're very cheap. I've just lost my pitot tube, but I can't see that, frankly. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> the good thing with their 70 second scale kits, you do get like a seated pilot. Yes. Uh, you get a standing pilot as well. Um, ladders. The MIG even came with like um, covers for the engines. Yeah. And I think the flankers do as well, don't they? I can't remember, to be honest. Definitely pick out the instructions. I mean, mm. not. Mine's got no weapons on it, but you definitely get a full because I just hate doing weapons anyway. Because obviously the other ones we built, we built the sea flankers, wasn't it? The SU-33s. Yeah. yeah. Which unfortunately mine met its maker. But, uh, you know, again, that was a fantastic kit. Their flanker series in general are all very nice in their mix. And like we've often said, isn't it, against the trumpeter, I've only done the trumpeter flanker, but uh, I know we've we've done compares between the two and everything else, and there's Vesda ones as well. Very, very nicely done. Nathan, your digital one's Vesda, isn't it? I think so. I won't get it, because that's worth showing. You it's a good job Matt's got them all there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no wonder yeah, we Mark... need a bloody bigger warehouse. <laughs> Mark was asking what the uh, helo I was showing. Yeah, it's the... Um... One centre second scale, what is it? MI26? Yes, yeah, MI26, the yeah. Halo, isn't MI26. it? MI26, yeah, Halo like, yeah, is the NATO code name for it. Yeah. It's a nice kit, it is. It, it, yeah. I think that's the thing, that value for money, because they are, they are value for money, aren't they, as the kits? Oh, yeah, they are, absolutely, yeah. Um, and for what you get out of the box, yeah, they do, they do build up really well. And, you know, if you want to add extra to them, I think, for my, in my mind, the, the one kit that they let themselves down on is, was the hind. The yeah, hind. which, you know, I've got the little baby one here. Yeah, that's cracking. That's fantastic. This is a, and to be honest with you, when I built this one, um, 
we did this one as a weekend build, wouldn't it? And yeah. messed around with it. But you look at the detail, it's got fully detailed engines. The cockpit actually has got detail, weirdly. It's not much, but for 70 seconds, you think that's totally acceptable and all the rest of it. You've got actually uh, an open gearbox and all the rest of it, of all the details. So when this little kit came along, I was really, really expecting the 48th to be a, just a bigger improvement on this because obviously yeah. this hasn't got riveting detail and all the rest of it but you wouldn't expect it in this scale so i think really that's why i was quite disappointed with the you know the when the 48th one came along because i thought they would take this one as the basic and then just think right okay we can really upgrade and take it to the next level but it's like a big version of this uh so that was sort of my slight disappointment with it really but again it's a beautiful kit and it goes together really really well you know they're very modular because they've all got different front ends because obviously the back end's all the same uh this yeah. is the uh uh 35 mi 35 uh but they do the 24 like john's got alongside him and all the other bits and pieces as well and uh but they are very very nice kits you know they just go together pretty much but say a little bit slightly disappointed with the other one because it wasn't as course. Yeah, that was reboxed by um, Rebel and then also by Eddard, wasn't it? Eddard, yeah, because this is actually uh, the Eddard edition, wasn't it, this one? I think I, did. I can't remember now. One or t'other. Uh, there we go, that's uh, Nathan's in the Splinter. Go on, Nate. Talk us through this Splinter Sorry, camo. digital camo, I should say. Digital, yeah. Well, that was... This flanker thing was kicked off by seeing this aircraft at Riyadh, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Ukrainians were flinging it around and we thought we all wanted to build a flanker after that. So that, I forget the name of the company that did the vinyl. Um, oh, God, no, Fox, no, Fox, no, Fox, 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 yeah, so they did the decal, they did the vinyl thing and then decals for it as well. But that kit, again, they went together really quickly, didn't they? So completely trouble-free build. We knocked these flankers out fairly sharpish, didn't we? We saw Nathan cry many a night doing that. Yeah, he had a bit of trouble with uh, that particular scheme, but it's it definitely it worth it because it looks absolutely stunning. Yeah, cracking. It's one of my sort of favourite builds, that one. That's why it stays in the cabinet, it's not dusty or anything, it's nice. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> dusty, exactly. yeah. it's not like everybody else is chucked out of the mezzanine. Yeah, was the Mesda one, Nathan, or the Trump one? Mesda. That was the Mesda one, wasn't it? So it's been a while since we built them, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Looking at it, it's pretty much the same as mine. The choice is the best of one. Yeah. I think so, it is. It's, um, yeah, it's, it does look nice in that scheme. Yeah. And like I said, when we seen him at Riyadh, that was the highlight of a, for me, a very disappointing day. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say. Uh, and waiting to see that at the end was worth, but definitely worth it. Let's face yeah. it, the weather was pants, so... It was just rubbish, wasn't it? It was compared to the day after, when it was bright sunshine and blistering yeah. hot, and we were got yeah. wind chilling. Yeah. Mm. yeah. We sat there watching it from the caravan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. Got a better view then than we did on the day. <laughs> right, okay, so last up, Nathan, you got your little one. Beautiful. Yeah, so this, this is a 2006 kit. Um, and weirdly, this mark, this sort of pale grey shows off what's quite nice about it. Hmm. I mean, if you're going to build a MiG-21, you're probably going to buy the Eddard kit now. But this one, I mean, I've put an aftermarket seat and pitot probe on it, but the level of detail is fine. I remember when I opened the box, I thought I was in for a, a bit of a treat because it looked quite softly moulded. But there were no fit issues at all. Yeah, so, so this is the, window. sorry, hold on, this is the MiG-21 so, uh, in 72nd. Yeah, so this is a 72 scale MiG-21 BIS. Yeah. Aftermarket decals for the DDR. Mm -hmm. But that kit, look, I looked, I saw it in the box and I thought, hmm, this is going to be one of them builds. But actually it fitted much better than it looked on the sprue. Yeah. And I think you're probably going to pick this kit up for 12 to 15 pounds. Yeah. And it, again, it's really nice, sort of out of the box, no dramas, but I did thought, I thought a seat and a pit at probe was worth it. And just to prove, don't just build aircraft all the time, but it's still 72 scale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> their little tanks are brilliant. I mean, their, their little tanks are really, really good. Um, and this is that this tank is out of the box, obviously, the dioramas. 
not, but the mm. tracks and everything, really, really nice. So I think their armor stuff is well worth a look. Yeah. I've not done any of their 35th scale stuff. I like to do little things, don't I? But there's nothing added to that tank. It is literally out of the box. And this, I think, is a 2015 mold. And again, it's under a tenner. I think I paid under a tenner for this. And it's, again, I'd, I'd recommend everybody just have a crack at this. No aftermarket at all on that. Very the, nice. Your SU, Nathan. Huh? Can you explain to Lynn how you did the digital camo on it? Yeah, it, I don't know if I've got the spares there. It's literally a port from Fox Box. They, it's literally a piece of vinyl. So it's like a piece of paper. And it was like canopy masks. It was all like, obviously, sort of laser cut up whatever they used to cut it and it was literally like you, you just mask it up like you would a canopy I'll switch on the other one. so if I can find one and if there's a gap in the show where I can jump around and find one of these vinyl sheets it's literally like an A4 sheet of vinyl all pre-cut then you just spray the colour mask it spray another colour mask it and to be honest so just so people know it's very similar isn't it from when we did the uh, I did the Enterprise spaceship yeah because mm. it's the same type of thing you end up with one giant sheet and you sort of peel it off and it all comes off all jaggy so you put down your base color put it over spray that next one and then you'll go the next one over the top so where i had it where it was little dots everywhere it's sort of doing it in reverse so it allows more through and things like that but it, it does just come on very large sheets but as nathan probably will it's like toothache it probably doesn't seem that bad now but at the time it was driving me <laughs> mad because of trying yeah. to get it on and off can be a little bit you know antsy isn't yeah. it because you're worried about taking the paint with it as well when you're doing that type of masking because it doesn't take much to suddenly rip it all up because those masks that type of one i know it's the same stuff that mine was made of um it, it's got quite a tacky surface to it it's got quite a bite so uh, when I was un unmasking the Enterprise, I was thinking at any point, this is going to go horrendous, really wrong, you know? Uh, but luckily it didn't, it stayed down. But I know you had to do a little bit of a touch up on it, wouldn't it? There was one bit where I had to get a second mask set because it had gone a bit wrong. So mm. I've got set to do a two seater one. So I've never, <laughs> I've not rushed into doing that again. Mm. But it's, it, it was easy enough and to do considering the result that you get. Hmm. Well, it wasn't much fun at the time. My, my only thing is, I'd, I'd say that because when it when you buy them, you can often get them in either Kobayashi tape, can't you? Or you can get the vinyl ones, mm -hmm. and if you can get the Kobayashi one, get the get the you know the Tammy tape type of stuff sticks mm. down better, doesn't it? Yeah. Than the other stuff, and also the vinyl ones tend to stretch sometimes, so especially yeah. like with Nathan's one, you've got bits sticking out you're not putting it on a flat surface are you you're putting it onto curves and things and trying to get it all to line up without puckering as well so you're left with little ups and you're trying to push them down that's why it's kudos to Nathan on that because it's uh it can be a bit of a handful trying to get them to conform and go around luckily the flanker is quite flat top and bottom but you still got to get it around the sides and all the bits in there so it can be a little bit of a a bit of a long drawn out thing but i think you've got to like set yourself i'm going to try and do this area and just work at it then do this area i wouldn't try and do it in one because otherwise you're going to end up with lots of overlaps and problems and things like that as well what's that i've got a burning question for john how many years did it take him to practice the perfect and subtle and fine art of sitting there <laughs> right that's famous words i just used to sit in here and letting this lot yap on that's oh. what it is. He likes <laughs> listening to us, don't you, John? Yes. John's a listener. I, I gave up trying to get a word in edgeways years ago with this one. Fighting <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a losing battle. <laughs> don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, I think that's the thing, isn't it? Um, you know, from my point of view, working on this truck is the first time that I've done any of their armour. I've never built Spencer armour before. Of course, can you hear that? That's a V8. That's very nice. 
Um, so uh, it's a Range Rover. Uh, but yeah, it, it's one of those ones where I've been absolutely blown away with the detail and the fit and how it all goes together. And you know, some of the other, you know, tricky areas, shall we say, have actually been really, really nice on this. So we've been working down here on the car, on the chassis. The detail that's in there is absolutely brilliant. Very, very nicely done, all of it, you know? And the great thing is, like we were saying before, the locating tabs and the little different areas onto it, if you follow along with the video build on it, you'll know that I pointed them out. You can't really get it wrong. And one of those areas came to fruition today because when I was doing the cab here, it's all still a loose fit, but these little bits down the back here, I thought these little slots on the outside were on the inside, but it's keyed because on, I don't know if you can see it, you can't see it on the underside, but on here, there's a big peg and a little peg for people who remember the kids program and uh, so I you couldn't put it the wrong way around so somebody's had the thought in the design process that instead of just having two pegs and holes and just putting it down to save the modeler putting them in the wrong way around which I would have done because I thought it went the other way they designed it with a big peg at the back small one at the front so that way it only goes one way you know and it's little attention to details like that where i really think you know somebody's had a bit of forethought to this it hasn't just been you know an engineer who's just trying to get as much as he can out of a you know a sprue and all the rest of it but it's been quite nicely done and it's been thought about when it all goes together and the same with these back areas the way it goes through so the mud flap system on the back here the little slots they go into they're different sizes so there's a left and a right if it makes sense so uh, you know it's clever little ways that they do all of these ones to think about it you know it's very tamir-esque in it it is yeah to be honest it's bordering on bandai in a lot of these areas uh because if it if, if physically if it doesn't go in you know it's you because you know it has been designed and it's been well thought out and I used to say, it's the first time I've worked with this Vesda kit before. And I've been blown away, one, by the detail. But also, once you've got past doing the cleanup and all the areas like that, it goes together really quickly. Because if you put this on a par with when I was working with the MRAP, parts count, there's probably not that much in it. It's definitely more on the MRAP, don't get me wrong. But this goes together, it clicks together, it holds itself together. With the MRAP, you have to sort of refine it and get it all in and all the rest of it. But this, it's literally placing it placing it placing it and little areas like we've got one just down in here the way that this tank system and the actual spare wheel holder works it's layered so this part here is is off of this tank here as part of the bottom bit then you put this one in and then this clicks to it but it's all invisible but it's actually all interlocked so there's only one way it will go and it but and again when i was putting it together these are very fiddly small parts but now it's on here it's proper on there it's not going to go anywhere purely because this entire piece is now all one so it's not like this is just glued on and held on they've actually taken the time to design it so it all is literally in one even though it's made up probably of 10 parts it's all very nicely put together and again it's that thing where I, it's definitely a modeler has been used in the design process which i think then is probably testimony what john was saying it's you know designed by modelers for modelers and i think it's one of those areas which is shown because it does go together really really nicely very very well yeah no call great obviously building one of their uh, 35th tanks hmm. the ferdinand here and again that was it's an easy build it's a really stress free build yeah uh, lincoln length tracks if i remember rightly and just it just goes together it's just nice not too many parts as well you know no interiors and all that they, sort of gubbins they always they always keep their kits to that nice sort of price bracket don't they they're not dirt cheap but they're not the most expensive yeah and i think that comes back to somewhat we said about the hind behind john there is that I was really disappointed with the kit and I think it showed through with the review but then a lot of people have said and I know like the guys have said it as well that if they were doing it to a price point that's probably why they didn't give it a full cockpit and then they knowing full well obviously Quinta were right behind them with it lined up to do it we now know obviously Zvezda's got um sorry not Zvezda, Eddard's got a box in it coming out with it all in as well so you know again if it was doing it quite you know sympathetically from a price point of view by not putting in all the detail it's brought it in at a reasonable price where it could be uh 80 100 quid kit like the rest of them so again yeah. i think they're playing to their market that's their price bracket that's what they want to be in a bit like airfix do so that's the mm -hmm. level of detail we can do in that price area so. that point came out round about the same time 
Quinter was just mm. hitting everyone's benches. I think yeah. there must have been something going on there. They knew mm. what was coming down the pipeline, and they just they've done they catered the kit yes. towards that. Yeah, it feels yeah. like it, doesn't it? Because they could have added all the detail, but the kit might have cost 20, 30 quid more Hmm. than what it does. I mean, it's because obviously Ed are reboxing it later this year, aren't they? Yeah. So, and they're adding their goodies to it as well. But it's, I don't know, it's such an iconic helicopter that the new aftermarket Ed Ard, like say, Quinter and there's a few others as well are just going to jump all over it anyway and upgrade it hmm. so i'd be interested to see how it how the trumpy one when that comes out stacked yeah. against because that is what 80 quid yes 90 quid something 80, 90 it's, quid, isn't it? you know it's a lot more than that is hmm. you're going to expect a lot more for your pennies aren't you we've already discussed it we are saying if, yeah. if the trumpeter one doesn't come out with full riveting and a full detail cockpit you know, then they're going to be in trouble with that kit because I think people will pay the slight little bit extra, like we said, and just put in the, like a Quinter Studios or anybody else's now, that beautiful resin 3D printed cockpit detail sets. I've used one now and I'm sold on it. I think it looks great. And in helicopters, especially with all of this glass, you can see it all. And they've got big wide opening doors as a rule. So that's the nice thing to it as well. So definitely, I think it's one of those ones where it's a well worth investment. You know, we often talk about, is it worth, can you see it all? Most of the time, probably not. But in helicopters and things like that, 3D you know, cockpits, you get that nice look of them, the raised details, the various things to it. It's not a flat photo etch or just a colour, you know, photo etch panel and all the rest of it, which I've used on other things. Uh, I think it's going to actually be a very much a, a well worth thing. It's just a shame that perhaps, like we've often said, it'd be nice if manufacturers got in with these companies in the first place. You know, because yeah. that's basically it. Quid to do the cockpit, sorry, cockpit cab for this thing. And they do the instrument panel on that but i can't really warrant an instrument panel because it's literally all you'd use um but again it's one of those if you want that level of detail and if you were going to have your doors all open and everything perhaps then definitely i'm planning to have my doors shut so yes chris, chris, chris has asked a question, question in chat it says is there a special year after, oh, who's done me? Who's done me? Uh, after when Zvezda kits are safe to buy any thoughts i think we mentioned it before but the the t90 was probably what, 10, 11 years ago then, they're looking out, I can't Yeah, remember. well that came out, what did you say, 2011 that came out. Yeah, our old kind. Oh, I think it's got to be 10, 12 years. I was going to say, it's got to be 10 years at least, isn't it? Oh, I think that kit came out when I first moved in here. Yeah, because that, that was the first model I entered a group field with. Hmm. It was the Hein. Right. The high, because I remember actually just saying, you know, the, uh, the 109F hmm. was a hmm. benchmark for a very long time until the Edor ones, they were the ones to get, and they're still good quality kits now. Yeah, yeah. they're quite cheap. I don't know if Nathan's got one in his stash, but I have got the Revell reboxing of it, and it's amazing. The Zvezda High came out in 2010. Yeah. yeah, my MiG-21 is 2006 and it was surprisingly good, mm. but I think 2010 onwards you'd probably say. Yeah. yeah, like everything, I think like we said before, we, we've spoken about ICM, isn't it? ICM yeah. went along and it was pretty, yeah. And then all of a sudden, as there's a rumours going around, we've discussed it before, certain people joined the company. Uh, and then obviously from that point onwards, they had a, you know, literally a chop and everything else was brilliant. Um, and again, Zvezda seemed to really rank it up around about that time. I think if you're looking at anything that's newer than 10 years old, it will definitely be on the good scale of it. But again, like all kits, some of them have some right gems back in the day, especially because they're the only ones that are available. So Yeah, yeah nobody sort of touched the Fs on the 109s. It's always the Gs, isn't it? He's yeah. the Fs. No. And they sort of filled a gap and then obviously had all kind of jumped in it a later date when they they started it but um yeah i still think they'd hold up today but i'll tell you what what we can't forget to mention about so that they're, they're airliners mm -hmm. yeah. definitely well, done that because they are really good kits yes and also they're ships yeah they do some really good ships and one of them that stands out for me that i think always what i did one and i've never got is their 172nd pirate ship 
Yes, was, I know the one really, you mean. Yeah. It's the black, um, the, like the Pirates of the Caribbean the one. Black Pearl, it's... that's not the Black Pearl. Yeah, and all that. <laughs> got a pirate ship, and yeah. I think they do a Roman um, and a Greek one, don't they? And a Viking ship as well. Yes. And yeah. obviously more, I'd say modern, but you know what I mean, up to date stuff and, and stuff like that. But yeah, we've definitely got an interesting catalogue. And again, the thing to think about as well when you're looking at Tesla is that they do do a lot of reboxings because this is the Boeing 787 that I did, the Dreamliner. This yeah. is the Tesla kit. Yeah. But it's reboxed by other people. So they, obviously this is the Revel reboxing. Decals are, uh, are aftermarket for this one. But uh, again, beautiful kit. You know, went together really well. Again, usual things. It's a slight little sink mark into it. But when you're dealing on this, it's not a problem. Bit of filler in there. You know and the various things and again it, it went together very very well you know but they do some obviously iconic i suppose don't they yeah Airlines, if you want yes. to put that they did the airbusters they did boeing they did the two pull-offs and now they've done the herc obviously they've got the herc yeah so they've done a herc in in 72nd which has not been done for ever no nope. um and God, the belts are going to bring out down the line. But yeah, I'm a big fan, to be honest. One yes. for price point and one for buildability. Mm. I must admit, I've been really, really blown away building this because I can honestly say doing this type of work normally doesn't interest me at all. Like chassis and doing all things like that. Because it's all stuff, really, you're not going to see it. But I've really enjoyed it. You know, again, like everything, there's a clean up. And like, I know I did joke and I, when I posted it up, I said about, you know, why have two locating pin uh, uh, um, sprue joins uh, when you can have seven? Because I went from ICM, which tend to do quite big, you know, their sprues, there's not a lot on it. They're well spaced apart to very busy sprues on these, you know, the sprues that they do, you know, there's lots of stuff going on with them. And they do tend to have a lot of, you know, sprue join marks right the way over the way that they do it, where obviously ICM and other companies don't have as many. Uh, but again, they're small, they're not a problem. And it is, it's that thing. I've been doing it quite methodically in sections. I get out all the parts, we clean up all the parts, which don't take much. And then it's gone together. And again, I haven't had a problem with it at all. It's been really, really nice. It has been, honestly, a very fun build. It'll be one of these ones that when it's done, it'll, the building stage, it'll be quite, you know, sad. I've really enjoyed <laughs> the build stage. Sometimes don't enjoy the build stage. Other times it's like, this one's been a lot of fun. So. Again, that comes down to kit design though, really, doesn't mm. it? Yeah. If the, the, the one criticism with them, especially their aircraft kit, is there can be a bit of a texture on the parts. They obviously don't spend a lot in polishing the moulds and mm. get that grainy texture. Do you know what, John? The funny thing is you say about that, this one doesn't, this truck. It's actually really polished. Um, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. But this truck doesn't have it. It has a slight flatness, shall we say, or satin finish to it, but it's not that normal one. So I remember doing obviously the 33, it had like that texture, as you say. Yeah. Um, you know, and I remember this one had it as well. It has a, a, just a it's fine one, grainy one, texture. Yeah. But actually this truck, I don't know if it's because it's a newer one or anything else, but all the parts on these are very, very nicely polished. I can probably just uh, grab a close up here. You can probably see this one's, uh, you know, with these, they've actually polished them now. So I'm not saying this is a standard, but it's definitely not like the others were. So, yeah. But it's the so same. Was, did your berry have ever texture? Yeah. All right, it's, not, it's no big issue. No. Just, just polish it out with a, yeah. a warm sanding sponge mm. and it's fine. And unless, really, unless you're doing anything yeah, you know, if you're doing a metal finish, yeah, you want it perfect, but otherwise you can get away with it. Mm. Yeah. The MiG-29 had it as well. Yeah, I think the Sukhoi did it from um, the 27. Yeah. What, one of the guys in chat is asking, what other Russian company, model making companies are there? Russian. Well, God, there was. Well, there was KP, a, wasn't it KPO, whatever they were? Uh, they're Polish. Are they Polish? They're Polish, what, yeah. What? Yeah, they've always been uh, always been posted. They're Polish. There was there was another. Um, oh, What's Novo, it? Novo is a Russian. Yeah. <laughs> now you're talking. But there's another one as well. Ark, Ark model. Are they Russian? Oh, could be. What about Eastern Express? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. Sean's making yeah. his best. Oh, Fisky. Yeah. Oh, uh, Fisky. I think <laughs> what? Uh, Miramar. Micro Mir, are they? Micro are they Micromere. Russian? I thought they were Ukrainian, but yeah, they could be Russian. Yeah. Oak models. I think, to be honest, though, the Vesta is by far the best of, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. of the bunch. Yeah. Do you know? Mm. You know, they've obviously set the standard for um, for themselves. I think. And again, yeah. I think one of the things with the company is, it, like this truck, for instance, they're doing lots of different variants, as we know. Uh, you know, and again, if you look at, uh, you know, certain manufacturers obviously have done, like ICM have done various trucks like this with various bits all over on it and stuff, but they've got a really nice broad market of all their kits. And like, as I said before, the flankers, they do the 35, is it John as well? In 72nd, the SU35? Yeah, uh, they do the 35, they do like the 30. The 30, is it? Yeah. That's two seaters. Yeah. 27, they've probably got all your stuff in 72nd cover, don't they? <laughs> from that yeah. scale, from the Flanker family and the Fulcrum family. Yeah. Big Antonov. Yeah. That out, didn't they? The 225. Yeah. 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 So you figures as well, they do a lot of little 70, is it 72nd scale figures? Yeah. Yeah, Wargaming. Yeah. 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 yeah, they do a little 1100 Farmers kits as well for Wargaming. Mm. They do. We've got some of them, but yeah, they do. Yeah, like I say, they're um, good manufacturer. Good manufacturer, yes, they've done well. So, yeah, so yeah. there you go. So, what we're saying is, don't write them off. Good manufacturer, no. some interesting stuff, good subjects, good kits, you know. Mm. And, um, you know, we, we think very highly of them, they've done well. Yeah, cool, very good. Right, should we do some questions? Aye, uh, I've got to find it. Hold on, I'm going to mess with this now. Uh, ask the team right okay first one up is from graham he says hi guys what is the best way to recreate mud or dust on a tank it's out of the rain <laughs> yeah that's it oh, i've done about model one sorry model uh, ones. to be honest the uh, best thing to do is watch phil's videos it's it's it, it's hard to explain how to do it without showing yeah you know obviously for muds and things like that i tend to use pigments with pva glue um you know because they can be quite good and he's got his Mod Podge, or whatever it's called. But the old, old school way would have been to use a talcum powder with pigments and things like that and mix it all together to give you Crash. a muddy hmm. thing. But you can buy things like this now. Yeah. Uh, 8K do it, um, Vallejo do it, loads of different companies make it. Yeah, it's, um, it's like a vinyl emulsion, but it's thick and it's got bits and... You don't want them. You never get the lid off. Can you get the lid off yours? It's not open. Well, <laughs> not mine's actually oh, look, you can watch this as it explodes all over. No. <laughs> I've just realised mine's actually still sealed. I'm taking this yeah, one. No, 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 it gets it open. rim and it sticks to itself. I think it's like white glue, sand and paint. It smells, like, it smells of emulsion. Though, I was going to say, haven't we agreed? We think this is emulsion paint with some grit shoved in it. I yeah. think it's um, Artex. Artex, yeah. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> it's, but, probably, it's, probably, it's probably got PVA in it and... It's, it's, you know, other stuff, yeah, but PVA emulsions, all that, yeah, grit and stuff, yeah. And your, um, hey, your Tamiya, oh, sorry, John. Your Tamiya mail tank will be a good one to watch, won't it? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Good point. I did yeah. loads of mud with that effect, yeah. See with that, didn't you? Yes. But if you're lazy like me, this stuff, obviously, like one of, like Andy said, either Vallejo, Mig. The AK, whoever, make your own, is a quick and lazy way to make texture. You can paint over it, dries rock hard really quick, and it's good for basing as well. Window yes. bases, if you just want to, you know, um, quick groundwork effect. It's good stuff. They, just... they also do, I know, I know Vallejo do pretty much exactly the same thing as that, yeah. but they also do splashes as well, which is like the same colours. But very thin, so you can use it for doing splash marks on your on your um, tanks and things. Yeah. And easy way of doing splashes if you put some loads of them onto your brush and get say a cocktail stick and flick your brush across your cocktail stick, you get like splatters onto the side of your. Um... I've got to say, Andy, do you know what's good for that? Phil's wash. Phil's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Phil's wash is brilliant for that yeah. because. 
it's one of them techniques where you don't have any control. Mm. Yeah. So you want to clean up where it, where you don't want it. And obviously with Phil's wash, way, yeah. oil paints are pretty good for it as well. But Phil's wash, because it's got texture in it, because of what it is, it get, it does give you that nice effect of splattered dirt, mud, whatever you want. And then, like I say, wherever it is you don't want it, you just clean it off. So Yeah, I did that on the little um, Tamiya T55. I didn't want it, it mega dirty, but I just wanted it to look like it had, it had been through mud. Mm. Yeah, and it's just the grime and dark dirt wash. Yeah. But one th one thing I'd be wet. careful of though is using different coloured dirts on the same vehicle. It's like yeah, going for say a matte finish and a gloss finish where it's dried or you know or, or whatever. But when, if you if you try and go with sometimes you see people use a dark earth and then like a, a rusty coloured earth. It just looks strange where you've got like the different colours together. Yeah, so like, you know, if it's going through muck, it's probably going through the same like that. I mean, that's all brown mud. Clay looks going through clay. Yeah, be careful how many different yeah, you know, sort of like colours you're using. Yeah, cause it looks a bit weird sometimes. Okay, it's like this one here. I actually used uh, plaster Paris. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mixed with a bit of PVA glue to keep it a bit more pliable and then literally just splattered around with it. I did this one donkey's years ago. And, uh, you know, as I say, you're then just trying to take what's on the ground and then put it onto the vehicle as it would in real life. You know, that was the whole point to it. But, uh, yeah, it, it's one of those ones where you, you're practicing with it and everything else. But nowadays, as you say, you can just buy straight off of the you know shelf, like those mud pots and all the rest of it, which I would play with it perhaps on a buster first to get a bit of a feel for it. And then you go through. You know, with this one, it was a little bit different. I wanted it to have this wet, horrible effect. So this is gloss. This is rock hard. Uh, it's got glosses in all the puddles. So then it's got a little bit of pigment in with it as well to stain the puddles so they still look like they're wet uh, and those types of things. But yeah, no, it was, a, it was a lot of fun playing with the mud. If you want a nice muddy effect and everything else, the kit was a lot of fun as well, I do have to say. I like that. It was a good kit. I had an heritage one of them, and Nathan. You know, and it's just <laughs> thing, isn't it? And that is going to be a... A mule for weathering, to be honest, because Nathan's yeah. already built it and um, it, what well, he just left it unpainted, basically, what primer and painting. So I'm going to use it as a bit of a test mule and a practice piece that I'll probably film, to be honest. Um, That's all right. Okay, yeah. hold on, I've lost my thing. There it is. Okay, so uh, Mike says, uh, I've made uh, a hash of a resin part and taken a few chunks out of the piece. What is the best way of filling resin? Uh, I was thinking about two part epoxy putty uh, and no matter what you suggest, I will be able to sand and shape the material. Uh, thanks again. Uh, personally with it, one of the easiest ways is I make up with super glue and a little bit of uh, baking soda or talcum powder works and you make up like a concrete and you just put it in into the holes and that and then that way you can just put it in and you can then just go through the great thing about using a super glue of resin it grips to it really hard the trouble is if you're going to use a normal traditional putty like a perfect plastic putty it doesn't really adhere to the surface it's going to especially resin it goes up to it and you can sand it but it's not part of it if you like so yeah using two-part epoxy I don't know, you know, you're making up small amounts and doing it and doing it that way. It's a bit of a long-winded way of doing it, but I suppose it's no different from making up super glue with talc, so you're doing the same type of thing with it. But, you know, I've done it a lot in the past with literally just using talc and super glue, you know, mm. and just mix it into a little bit of a paste so it looks just like, you know, fondant really, and then you just put it in. It will dry pretty good. And then, uh, you know, you can just sand it and away you go and you won't take too much out because what happens is, is that the, the, the pigment, if you like, or the powder part of it makes it easier to sand. So you don't end up with having a rock hard. If you'd use just uh, super glue, that will go so hard. And when you sand it, you'll take away all the resin around it, but not it because it will take more to sand it. So especially if you're a bit heavy handed and pushing down on the sander and things like that. I don't know, you guys? I'd do exactly the same, either, like I say, the two part epoxy, but I'd probably mm. use super glue and 
Yeah, depending on how big it is. If it's small enough, just just pure super glue and kicker and mm. sand it, or if it's a big, big chunk, yeah, put some talc something in it. To be I'll honest, I've also used the old sprue goo. To be honest, I've done that on small little pinholes. I just give it a thump, 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 and sand it afterwards. I think, like you said, I think for pinholes that's fine. If it's kind of structural, mm. it's it's like you've just said, it's adhering what you're putting on to the resin. Yeah. Do not, you know, so yeah. I think probably the sprue goo way will do it. I was actually thinking of a proper like car filler. Yeah, pop. yeah, obviously you can use yeah. thick filler as well. Like, you know, you know, the more the more the finer stuff, not the heavy grade, you yeah. know, body filler, but you get obviously the finer stuff for uh, shaping and pinholes and stuff, mm. which again is two part. Yeah. Um, get it in like a little bag one and you get your little hardener and again. But I'm not sure how it would actually adhere to the resin, as in when you start sanding and shaping, would it just break off? Yeah. I don't know. You could do like pinning it, mm-hmm. you know, like concrete. Put yeah. Some, yeah. Well, don't forget, if, if you go back and see like when I did the Bowcaster or any of my other yeah. resin props, I always pin as well because it, structurally super glue as we know it it's fine super glue's rock hard but what, yeah. you know if it's up against resin and it's not pinned or anything else it only takes a small jolt and it will just come away because yeah. it's not part of it it's not structural so i always pin and then super glue as well so it works like rebar almost in concrete yeah. you know to hold it all together uh, and that's how you have to do it especially if you're going to be handling it and throwing it around it's not so bad if you just got it on display it'll hold together but if you're going to be carrying it it's going to come apart in no time at all so it will need something structural but if you're talking about like you've just taken some chunks and edges off and things like that then i just go super glue and filler and um, you but you say you could make up a little bit of two-part epoxy and things like that but again it's that thing you know if you're using like a five minute epoxy you know just make up a very small amount make it up when it starts to go a little bit because you don't want it to be sinking and going everywhere you know and then put it on that's why in some ways using like a car filler is probably a good idea because you can have it like a paste then and shape it quite nicely and it'll be easier okay. to sand and you can drill it if you, if you if people in the forum it's, it's moved i can't see it suggested but the uv glue might be another option it's all super bold the show is sponsored by <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was asking what beer I'm drinking. <laughs> Sent it now. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, Danny says, Hi, Phil and Matt. Uh, hope you're doing okay. I've just bought a relatively new Meng F18E uh, Super Hornet and it's a lovely kit. Uh, I know you have probably built a million Hornets. No, just I think we're now into 300, 275 or something. Not that far. Uh, but I would like to ask Phil in particular if he had any plans to build a kit or even the Hobby Boss one. Uh, I think the Meng kit is better uh, going by the reviews. You obviously haven't seen my review then. Uh, right, so I probably will do it um, because I'm going to do the Hobby Boss one because I think the Hobby Boss one's a better kit. Or it, it is from my point of view of how I'd like to display it. So um, from that point of view, I probably will. Will I do it this year? I'm not sure. because obviously we're halfway through it already. Um, but definitely it will be one of my to-do ones. But we didn't do a Hornet that long ago. Obviously I did the Legacy Hornet. Uh, but I will probably get around to it at some point. Because I'd like to really do a line jet and weather it to hell. Because normally I do them in CAG markings and nice markings. But I'm probably just going to do a boring grey one. But absolutely weather it to bits. So, Yes. And uh, Donald says, uh, Hi Phil, Matt and Andy, and John and Nathan. Uh, I've only been back into the hobby for the last uh, past few years and I've been watching all of your live shows and your videos. Uh, I was amazed how far techniques and materials have advanced. Uh, I have just completed the Eddard Spitfire 48 scale and has watched your video on using oils to fade and blend the base colours along with exhaust streaks and oil staining. It came out pretty well for my first attempt. Uh, also did the same with your dark dirt wash. Cool, very good. Welcome back to it. Now you'll be hooked. Uh, he says, I've now started on the Tamiya Chieftain Mark V in 35th scale. Uh, I have just ordered a couple of sets of pigments uh, and was wondering how I can use them uh, in this build. Uh, maybe a technique uh, to a future video. 
I know what you mean. I don't think I've been back. So I thought I had a video on doing standalone techniques with pigments and stuff. Uh, it turns out actually I don't. A good one to watch though is to look at Easy 8 because Easy 8, I literally, the only thing I used on this, it's an older video. So the photos haven't come through when we did this and I don't know what part it was, but as you can see, we did Easy 8. This is just pigments and wash on here. There's nothing else. So again, this was sort of my masterclass on using sort of pigments, if you like, to do rusty, metal-y type things and various things to it. We made a little base for it as well uh, and went through and did it. So we used it for sort of streaking and getting tide effects. So you're using basically enamels and then pigments on top and then mixes of both. So uh, if you go back and have a look at the Easy 8 build, it's a beautiful kit, very, very nice build. And we did all the weathering with it with pigments. So that is really my sort of masterclass on pigments, if you like, of going through and using it on this lump. Mm. Little photo stopped there for some reason. But <laughs> uh, yes, very nice. But yeah, have a look at that one, because that one literally is just all about it. We do all the tracks with it. Literally everything is done with it. So yeah, it's a good one to do. Just a word of warning with pigments. Hmm. Be very sparing with them. Yes. Because a little does go a long way and you'll end up with just a monotone sort of look to it. And they're very delicate as well. It's one of them, put it on and leave it. Because the all that you can put seal it and everything else. But if you seal it, to me, you lose the yeah. you, you lose the colour. I think you lose 80% of everything you put on if you overcoat yeah. it. You know? Yeah, to be honest, pig, the pigment way of weathering now has become very unfashionable if... if from especially my point of view, because I use pigments, and it just—I think there's a place, but it's—it's it's not like it was 20 years ago. No. When it was the next big thing. Yes. I think the the, the, I carry on. Sorry. Um, I think more if you're going to start with oil paints and stuff, you'll probably get a safer way of weathering fills wash whatever way if you don't like it you can take it back off pigments are very permanent even if they're dry they will grip and stain yeah yeah i think the problem you got with pigments is they're just very very messy you know i yeah. know i i don't manufacture them i buy them in bulk and they come into me in five kilo bags and they are the most messiest horriblest job you can imagine so yeah it is sorry john go on. i was going to say and another thing, if you feel a sneeze coming on, turn away. <laughs> but deep me, I found out the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And don't wear nice clothes, because I've learned the hard way from that as well, where I've had rust wash uh, or rust pigment, and then it's gone on to something like jeans. You don't notice you're wearing it. Then you sit on something like the bed, which has got a white duvet on it. Yeah, that didn't go down well. I've done that before. So, yes. No. I mean, there's definitely, definitely a place for pigments. Mm. It's, it's how you use them and when you use them is the technique. I don't think they've been any good for actually fully weathering anymore, if that makes sense. I think there's better options out yes. there you can use. Um, but again, you need to you need to try for yourself and see what yeah. results you get. Isn't it? It's another it's another tool in the arsenal, though, isn't it? Yeah, you can sort of like, you know, yeah. 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 It's a nice quick way of weathering because I've been, I did it on this 72 tank and I just used the mud brown and fixed it afterwards and it was weathered like that. So yeah. Oils are better, but it's going to take you a lot, lot longer, isn't it? If you want a quick one, two, you're done. Pigments and wash. Yeah, because obviously last time I used it, I suppose, properly was on this, on the the MRAP. But that's all wash on there. There's a little bit of oils, but the way I use the pigment is very sort of to use it as a dust effect. So it's, I put it around the wheels and it's so it just in as if it's been driving on it. It's inside the cab and I put a little bit just brushing it around over the dash to give that effect of like it's in a dusty environment and obviously over the back in these areas. But I used it almost just as a dust effect rather than a full on effect. But it adds that next layer because it looks dusty. It doesn't look like clay wash where it's sat there doing nothing you know so that way you can still use it all over but i tend to use it now as uh the last stage you know certainly i wouldn't touch it and you don't overcoat it because i think you one if you touch it you will rub it off uh, and secondly mm. you've got that thing where if you overcoat it especially things on tires i think it will just go back to being black again you know because it oh. will just absorb into it and kill it 
But again, I think you hit, hit the nail on the head there, to be honest. I think look, with wheels and tyres and mm. probably running gears on tanks and lower or, um, parts of the hull, yeah. brilliant, because it does give you that dusty, yes. matte, you know, effect of dirt. Yeah. But when you start putting it on the top, mm -hmm. you know, especially like on a, a, a tank, say, like you've done it, you put it in the cab and stuff again, I think it's, I think it's brilliant for cockpits, yeah. dusty yeah. cockpits. Sparing me in corners, things like that. Yeah. I think once you start putting it on the top of things, then it can get a bit out of hand. Yes. And I'm speaking from experience here with a few older builds. I think that's where its limitations, you know, there's better techniques than, than doing it that way. Hmm. You so, uh, you forgot the back door, Phil. <laughs> yeah, no, I forgot to paint that. It's all right, it's probably come off it now, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, it's still there. There I'm it is, look, that off. nice new back door. <laughs> I've come four times. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, like again, I think like Andy said, it, it's a tool. So, you know, you've got clay washes if you want, and then obviously you've got your oil washes, you know, you've got your all your different ones as well, and then you've got your pigments, you know. So you say you use them all at their different stage right the way through, and they've all got their real plus points and they've got their negative points like everything. So it's definitely mm -hmm. worth having it in your arsenal. But again, I think I'm with Matt. I tend to use mine as that sort of last finishing off bit just to flatten down an area as well, especially if you're thinking, you know, like especially tires. You know, those yeah. ones are resin tires, but especially like with these ones, which are, you know, this type of stuff, you know, you'd need something to knock this back and pigments will work quite well with it, you know. So, yeah, it's definitely one of those ones which you could use. Mm. Okay, Bruce says, uh, hi, Phil. Sorry you're suffering in the heat. Uh, that would be a pleasantly warm day down here. See, look, there's always somebody in it. It's like a Tommy Topper situation. <laughs> the heat. <laughs> okay, now to my question. Recently, when organising my modelling supplies, I came across a box of Poly S paints, uh, which I bought many years ago. They've never been opened. After mixing with a battery-powered shaker, they appear okay. Do you think that they will be uh, used? Uh, or what do you think of Poly S? Uh, I understand the product ceased in 2015. I've still got some. Somewhere. Did they get taken over by testers? Somewhere, I've got them in here. There you go. I got them. So, yeah, I must admit, I used to like these paints. I used to use them all the time, years and years ago. Uh, but yeah, polyscale. But pure, yeah, I think testers bought them out, didn't they? Yeah. So yeah, that was why they demised. But are, they, are they enamel or acrylic? Uh, acrylic. Acrylic. Yeah, they smell really nice, if I remember rightly. They've got these horrible paper lids that should never come off. Yeah, look, there you go. Yeah. So what are you thin it with? Distilled water? I think it's this one may be a bit... I won't stick that in it. Let me stick something in it. <clears throat> I've got a somewhat of a skin, everyone. <laughs> Let me show you this on overhead. <laughs> We've got extra acrylics going on here. Yeah, it is, literally. So let me move the helicopter out of the way. But we have got a small little drum skin. Oh, but I'm sure it's fine. Yeah, it is. Yeah, nothing wrong with this. Actually, do you know what? It's nice. I used to love the smell of polyscale. It's really good. If it's a brand new bottle, honestly, and you haven't opened this one's clearly been opened because it's got paint down the side of it. But honestly, if it, if you haven't been used, I think as long as you mix them up thoroughly well, you should be okay with it. I'll get the lid back on. Ah, can't get the little. That's it. Really. I've got some of that. I've never used it. Yeah. I think I've got some of that. I've never had it. I've heard of it, but never. Yeah, seen I've got quite it a few in there. But yeah, I, I, they were my sort of bread and butter paint for a while, and then obviously they went, and then they say I think testers bought them out, uh, and that was the end of them. But again, I used to use them, and they were great paints. They were my sort of go-to acrylic for a long, long time. So, yes, but I think, you know, technically you should be fine, shouldn't you, really? I think as long well, yeah. as you thoroughly mix it, if it hasn't been unopened and it hasn't dried out and all the rest of it, I think you'd be fine with it. I do think, just bear in mind that it's an acrylic, not a yeah. lacquer paint. You're going to have the same problems you probably have with any acrylic. Yes. Get a buster out and see. Pretty yeah, test you your paint on something else, as always, like we say, isn't it, to make sure you'll be fine. Um, anyway, it says, P.S. Uh, Melbourne is in its fifth COVID lockdown. Oh dear, not good. 
Uh, we're in our, uh, was it 2.7? <laughs> yeah. We're in 2.7 here because everyone's been pinged by an app. <laughs> yeah, they cancelled it on Monday. It's all finished now. Yeah, no, it's all over apparently. Tell my other half that. My mum got pinged yesterday. Oh, no. Which is the yeah. thing is, do you know what's funny? She hasn't been anywhere. She's mm, literally, she, she's it. been at home. She hasn't even been out. No one's been around and all the rest of it, yet she got pinged. She says, my phone's just said I've got to isolate. And it's like, where have you been? Because I haven't even been out. It's the next door neighbours, someone at work got yeah. pinged because of their neighbours. Yeah. And even though there's a brick wall between them, it doesn't pick up on that. Or, or <laughs> post, postman or milkman or... Could be anything. Know, but as you say, it's like she's because she's like getting quite worried, and I'm like, but you feel okay and everything. She's like, yeah, no, I feel fine. So it's like, mm. oh, and she is fine. Spoke to her again today, and she's all right. But yeah, she's now self isolating. Right. David <laughs> says ping a UK thing. Now we have yeah. um, a app. I'll show you the um, app. Works, with, works, works, works by Bluetooth, and if you come in close contact for a certain amount of time with somebody who's confirmed with COVID. No, it sends see. you an alert telling you you got self isolate for ten days. That's Problem is, is half the country now are self isolated. For 10 days. Well, look, Nathan's fine. He's green, but he so goes, goes red. red. If he goes red. You've got to stay at home for ten days, and it literally just it picks up your exposure, the amount of time you've been. So if I if I do a COVID test and report myself as positive, several other people will get pinged. Yes. But what a lot of people are doing now is switching their Bluetooth off to get around it, apparently. Yeah, or just deleting the app, isn't it? So, <laughs> yes. Which is brilliant. Well done, everyone. I've got I, know, I know some have never had it on. <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> so if I just put a test result in here, like positive, it will obviously ping anybody that I've been... I think in 15 minutes or something, you've got to be... Yeah, in the vicinity of, yeah. Minutes or no, like it's, it's not a requirement at all it's just that yeah it's a uh, being people, good sensible people have it on and other people don't yes they it's call it called a ping pandemic now right <laughs> nhs covid19 it's called i've had it on since it came out i've mm. not been paid if all us posties had that app all the oh, way yeah. through it you <laughs> lot would never get any of your model supplies and kits because we'd all <laughs> be off but when you told to you that Nathan, when you're at school i will the kids are not allowed it because, I mean, if the kids had it on their phone, my God, it would have been pinged like mad. I was told to think about switching it off unofficially. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> think about turning it off. So Just have a think about it. And I, was, I mean, that was completely like on the QT, obviously. But I, the, anyone under 16 wasn't allowed to put it on their phone. Hmm. And that got around that problem. James says people been saying that they've been p tested positive just go off work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think you it's do the nice weather. <laughs> have a key with fruit and then do a test. I think it comes out positive. <laughs> so from from about two weeks on Thursday, is it to a week or uh, two well, two weeks Monday, three weeks Monday? I'll be pinging and I won't be available to see anybody. <laughs> 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 Okay, uh, Andrew says, hello all. Phil, I was using your classic build of your Tamiya 130 second Spitfire. If you was to build it again, horrible thought not, uh, what would you do differently? Also, do you have it there? I do, it's still here. Yeah. One of the few from this age, because this is quite an old build now. Uh, yeah. This one's got to be at least sort of 15 years old now, because uh, I did it when it, the kit very first came out. Um, yeah, no, as I say, what would I do differently? We were talking about this just before we came on and I got it out. From a painting point of view uh, and things like that, probably nothing. It's just that from a weathering point of view, this had no weathering onto it whatsoever. It literally had the wash and that was it. So now I would probably use a bit of oils with it. We'd probably, you know, modulate the, the green a bit more and break it up a little bit more. I might flatten it back a bit to give it a more sort of used look and everything. But this literally was just paint, decals, wash, done. Uh, but now I would probably detail up the engine. So I'll get in there with more wiring for the engine. The engine's absolutely fine, but it needs wiring. The harnesses, I use the Tamiya 
photo etch harnesses which look awful so i'd probably consider putting in a decent set of harnesses and obviously i wouldn't do the escape bar in red because as we all know clearly now we do that they were never painted red in world war ii that was a requirement that came in post-war um, so yeah but generally the kit itself is fantastic right out of the box like all Tamiya kits of this you know ilk they just need a little bit more you know just a little bit of something to make them a little bit more finessed so I think in wiring around the engine uh, new harnesses painting wise probably the same decal wise though I would probably you know maybe use different decals or something else like that because I say Tamiya's are quite thick but these have gone down quite well but you can see them a bit but I think by the time you get weathering on it and all the other bits it'll turn out absolutely fine hold on let me stick it on the overhead you can see it a bit better so but yeah the only thing is i don't know what i've done with my cowlings <laughs> they're around somewhere so we do with the doors yeah to be honest it's, it's 15 years old bless it <laughs> so but yeah generally i think it, it's all right it's a beautiful kit if anybody ever wants to do a, a you know a spitfire the tammy ones are absolutely gorgeous Turn it upside down again. Where's all its leaks? Well, yeah, but I, that's what I was saying. I didn't really weather it. It just had a wash. We'll get some oil paste and do it now. Well, just no. a quick, an extra, what, with all this dust on it? Just put an extra part on the end of the video. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Slight delay. 15 years later, I finish it off. It'll be, the, hey, it'll be like Blade Runner, editor's edition. Yeah, the editor's edition, yeah. We'll re-weather and go around, do the modulation. But I might have to, like, polish the windows again because they're proper manky. But, uh, yeah. no, it is a really nice kit, but it just needs that little bit of finesse now. So that's all I'd do. I'd literally just wire the engine, probably put in some um, fabric uh, harnesses into it uh, and things like that. Uh, but, again, weathering would be the main thing right the way through i just probably bleach it out a little bit and say a bit of yellow down on here on the green and things just to make it a little bit more faded work with the grays a bit more sort of modulation into the paints just to break it up a bit but Put a um, pilot in it needs a pilot if i could find anyone to paint me a pilot i'll oh, do that oh, right, true. <laughs> that's it on a diorama base on an airfield in world war Two. so <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that you know, but again, it's a beautiful kit. It's very, very nice. The great thing with the Tamiya kits is no different from the, the Zero. You know, that the Zero came out years before that one did. And then that one came out, then the Mustang, then the Mosquito. So yeah. very nice indeed. Uh, it also says, another question is, if I may, uh, how uh, and what do you consider when painting parts before gluing them to the model? Simplata ease is it going to be easier to paint it before i stick it on to get in around it and to paint it and detail it or is it going to be okay on classic example we speak about this on this video build actually this entire chassis is black so i can put all of this together and then paint it all black and then it will be dry brushed and it might have some various bits on there and washes on that to break it all up but we can paint all of this in one so when i'm putting this together obviously the bed we can't because the bed's going to be a different color so you know that's going to be done so that's why we built it in this way so it can all be painted the engine as well slightly different color so the engine can't go in yet so that'll be painted separate because that way i can get in around it and i can weather it and then once it's done i'll then obviously we'll come along and we'll install it in so uh, that's the thing so that's when i'm doing it is to work out is it going to be Put it on there now because it doesn't matter we can do it all in one or is it got to be painted how easy is it to paint it sometimes i might put it on because it's easy to paint it but if it's a little bit of a faff trying to get around it i'll do it afterwards you guys what would you do i like to try and glue as much together as i can and then spray it because sometimes when you put glue on afterwards it can mess your paint up but having said that there's an undercarriage door here which is being painted on the sprue and I'll just nip it off at the end and touch in. Yeah. My general rule is glue as much together as I can and then paint. I tend to find sometimes you disturb the paint when you're gluing. So like the Buccaneer cockpit, I glued it all together and sprayed it all in one go. Hmm. But for little bits and bobs like aerials and stuff, I will paint them on the sprue because it's the easiest way to hold part, isn't it? Hmm. A bit it just depends really there's no hard and fast rule yeah yeah guys go on. john yeah, quite often what i'll do is i actually cut the runner off the sprue the part that it's attached to 
So you've just got the part with a little bit of the, the, the sprue on it. Mm. Um, I find that's easier for me than if you're spraying or whatever. Trying not to get it over everything on the sprue. Yeah. And it's easier as well if you've got, especially things like undercarriage parts. Yes. If you have to clean up like a uh, mould line. Mm -hmm. So I take it off, but I still leave part of the sprue on it just to give you a little handle, really. Yes. Yeah. I think it's just one of those things. Sometimes, like obviously, if you do weapons, completely contrast to it, and they can go easily on afterwards. You know, so anything that sticks out that's going to get knocked off anyway goes on at the end. So that's normally how I go about doing it. But it's normally just think about how easy is it going to be painting it if you if it's a different color. So like on this guy down in here, say the fuel tank's a different color, you've got all the framing all the way around it. Is it easier to actually take the fuel tank off, paint that completely separate color, spray it all black, and then say it's in aluminium, you can just put it in afterwards with a dab of glue. That way all the framework all around it's fine without trying to get in here with a brush and paint it when it's down in there. So that's literally how I go about doing it. Purely what's the easiest, quickest, safest way of doing it. I do find it interesting when you see people doing the Gundam figures. Mm. And they've got like 500 crocodile clips with, <laughs> yeah, all, yeah, all sticking up with, you know, with all the different colours and that, yeah, and it all goes together at the end. Hmm. And they do literally paint every single item separately, don't they? Yeah. And you start thinking, how the hell are you going to get that back together again? But Apparently that's the proper way of doing it. And don't dare what I did was thinking, do you know what? I could just spray it on the sprue and then I'll touch in all the parts afterwards. So, but we won't go down that route again. No. <laughs> Wait for the hate mail to start flowing in. <laughs> okay uh paul says hi phil matt andy and nathan delete where appropriate full house today have you used a 3d printer pen i've just bought the tech boss intelligent 3d pen which arrives tomorrow wednesday uh right so okay so basically these are pla pens isn't it so it's no different yeah. from the 3d <laughs> printers apart from you do it not the printer um, again, I spoke to me and Matt were talking about it earlier and I was saying that I saw a guy once on YouTube was using it as filler for aircraft, you know, because yeah, obviously, I'd you know, idea. putting it on. But my worry is, is again, we're back to adhesion. How well would it stick to the model when you sand it? Is it just going to fall out? I don't know. I, th I think if you're very arty and good at drawing, yeah, you might be able to do something half decent with it, but... Again, I don't think you get the small enough scale because I mean, like uh, the type of resin printers that we've got do um, point. Is it point zero five of a millimetre? Mm. You'd never, you, you can't get anywhere near that sort of that finesse no. with that type of thing. What could you use it for? I don't know. Again, yeah, I've seen the videos of it. You get people, and I think the video I saw, he was doing something like the Eiffel Tower with it. So basically yeah. what it does, if you imagine a glue gun for people who don't know, it's like that, but it's using PLA, you know, the, the fiber. So it goes through it, it melts it, and then it dries instantly as soon as it comes past the nozzle, because obviously with the cooling. So you can build up and you can make figures and things with it. And again, I think if you're very creative and an artist, you could probably do great things. If you're a bit like me, I'd be limited to matchstick men on my mat and then cut it off. You know, yeah. scrape it up and I've got a matchstick man that'd be about as best as I could do but they do it in different colored filaments and various things to it but basically imagine a PLA printer you know the fiber ones on a, on a drum it's working the same way but you're doing it instead of the printer so yeah I, I just can't see how you would do it I, you're not going to be making unless again you're very arty accessories with it I don't think I'll be making a, like a fuel <laughs> drum with it no, I suppose you could make sandbags and things with them, but, yeah. you know, bits of, you know, that, yeah, I don't know. Mm. Don't know. Very, very tricky with that one. I personally, when it very first came out years ago, um, I remember it and I saw it and I did see a guy go back years and he was using it as a filler on models. But it was just making a mess. It was all over the place. And I'm thinking, by the time he's messed around with all of that, I could have done it. You know, so, yeah. Uh, David says, hi, Phil and gang. Uh, this is a question for Phil regarding weathering. Uh, I've just finished his B24 desert sand uh, dark grey bottom. What would you suggest the approach uh, after the decals have applied? 
Thank you for all your help and insight. I would seal them in with a nice satin coat of clear. So it's all nicely got a nice texture to it, but it is. And then I would probably give it a grime wash right the way over because the grime wash will show quite nicely in that. So it's got that sandy earthy look rather than the dark dirt, which is quite dark over it. And then again, you're into that thing where if you wanted to break it up a little bit, you could use oils. So, you know, you could come in there with little bits of buff with the oil and blend like we've shown before and break up the sandy top colour. Exactly the same for the underside with lighter shades and darker shades of greys and things like that to break it up a little bit. And then, you know, basically you're into, you know, uh, any type of other weathering you want to do for sort of smoke stains and various things to it. But probably I would use a, 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 the grime wash because it's quite a sandy earthy colour over the dark dirt wash, which is obviously quite dark. As your base so that'll do all your panel lines and all your bits and pieces and then go in there with oils afterwards you guys what do you think um, yeah uh, oils definitely yeah, yeah. yeah pigments so be a good shout that. And stuff yeah, as if it's in the wheel wells um and again wash usual usual sort of layering technique i think for weathering isn't it yeah um, I don't think I'd do it differently. I might even crack out the uh, AK pencils. Oh. I'm a big fan, aren't we? <laughs> we are. They are the future. <laughs> uh, Brendan's question we'll just leave for today. We'll come back to that one other way. David as well has done a bit of a shout out thing. So we say we're sort of running out of time. We've only literally got five minutes left here. So we'll come back to that one another day. Uh, Mark says, question really for Nathan. Because uh, we, we haven't had a question about RLM paints for a few yeah, weeks now while, so roughly. it had to come you say anyway uh he's got the ak real colors world war ii luftwaffe paint set and it's got the rlm 74 75 76 there's two yeah. versions of the 76 one is early war one is the other one late question mark yeah. uh is the state versions uh one or two in the jars it states one or two versions of the jars yes yeah. What it's got in that paint set is a version of RLM 76 that looks like RAF Sky. And it's a possibly maybe colour again. Um, <laughs> but that would be for the literally the last couple of months of the war. So you're probably going to use the one that's more blue grey. Huh. Because there is a thinking, I mean, there's evidence floating around that there's this fun funky sky colour and it's they think it's RLM. 76 but well, i'd only use that for something that's like stupidly late war hmm. so i'm probably going to use the other one I, I think um it's another one of those colors that you're in late war thing in a mess and i'm not jumping down any rabbit holes because it's four minutes tonight <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we could stretch this question out at least till nine o'clock and then we'll just have to carry the next <laughs> lot on until next Thursday. So, come on, Nathan. I mean, can indulge us in RLM 76. <laughs> Sorry? I said, indulge us in RLM 76. You want to know more about RLM 76? Well, it was to tone. They have, R they have two versions of RLM 65, which most people accept is fairly correct. Because yeah. They had a very bright blue on the side and then that got toned down. Mm. And I think the difference in the two is down to some sort of lacquers as well. We're using lacquers. But RLM 76 came in sort of mid war. But it is a light blue they used as well. Um, Attacker's got one, I'm sure. What's the other number? Six, well, there's it's another, 65, 76, but I'm sure there's another number as well. There is, there's another number, and it's for the desert ones, and I've gone blank off the top of my head. I have. John, Yeah, I'm just having a look. I can't think what it is. I've just bought that off you as well. I'm reaching. I'll tell you what, I've got to have a look because that's annoying me. <laughs> whilst I just do that, he also says, uh, Phil, whose videos are keeping me entertained during my isolation period, it's too hot for modelling. It's like an oven in his flat. He's really enjoying the 190 Super Build at the moment. Right, found it. RLM 78. That's the one. That's on the desert ones. Is that what that is? Ah, oh, I see. I've just bought that off you. But 76 was just like a paler version of 65, so it's more of a blue. Yeah. But yeah. There is mock, there's a mock difference between the two. Have you got both the 76s? Yeah, the, the, late, the late one is definitely... It's like Sky. Hold it yeah. up to the camera, John. 
Oh yeah, that's totally different, isn't it? So that sky coloured one is literally for the sort of closing months, like even like 1945 that late. Because there's a couple, um, couple of pictures online of like Luftwaffe stuff in what RAF sky basically. Yeah. And they, that's why AK have done this interesting thing where most paint manufacturers have gone to a reference and attach their paint range to that reference. Whereas what AK have done is said, well, there's two or three versions. We're not sure. So they've released a lot. And it's, it's like, which one do you want them to do? I don't know. Covers all bases, doesn't it? Yeah. So I think... <laughs> all right. Grab it all finished now because it's nine o'clock. Now I need to work. <laughs> so, so as I'm the director producer guy sat here, that's it guys. Wrap it up please. You've got uh, so you go. That's it. Play the <laughs> outro. <laughs> before, before we go. <laughs> and since we're not doing a show tomorrow. Yeah. Bill is. I am. Bill, Bill is. Anything? No, Bill's doing it tomorrow. He's, I'll he's do the it man. tomorrow. It's all right. Leave it with me. I'll do Bill's it tomorrow. Bill's going to do it tomorrow. Yeah. I'll yeah. do it. So from, what time is it, Andy? What, what they don't know about is from yeah. 10 o'clock tomorrow. Right, from <laughs> 10 o'clock tomorrow is the best to sale. 10% off all the best of kits. Yeah. Phil, Phil will tell you about it tomorrow. Full That's details it. tomorrow, but there you go. You've had that one as well. <laughs> Okay, right. So uh, <laughs> the questions, I'll roll them over tomorrow because I can answer all of those anyway. So they're for me as well. So that's not a problem. Right. Okay. Can, it is can nine o'clock. No, too can late. Not good. He said we've got to go at nine o'clock. One second. Before we go, we've had 10% off Meng this week. That finishes at midnight tonight. So if you want anything from um, 10% off Meng, get your kits now. <laughs> and don't forget to like and subscribe. I've just got to say this because the first part of the Vulcan is up tomorrow. So if you don't like and subscribe, you'll never know <laughs> as well. Anyway, I'll be back up with you tomorrow. Uh, I'll be putting the video up around about mid-afternoon where we'll be just discussing the 10% <laughs> off deal and all the other things as well that we haven't spoke about today. Okay, right. Are we all good then? Are we all sorted? Yeah. yeah. Right. Say goodnight, gentlemen. I'll play us the outro music if I can find it. Bye. 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 <laughs> That's it. Bye, everybody.